Tech family, you spoke and I listened. About two weeks ago, I put a poll up asking what laptop you wanted to see most, and this laptop won by a landslide. I'm only joking, this one did. It's the Lenovo IdeaPad 514 with the new Ryzen 8 core 4700U processor, the smaller sibling to the IdeaPad 515 that I gave a rave review of a couple of weeks ago. In this video, I'm going to thoroughly review the laptop and compare it to the IdeaPad 515, as well as draw comparisons to many other laptops out there, including Apple's MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro 13, the new Dell XPS 9300, and Asus AMD Swift 3. I'm Josh, and I buy and review a lot of laptops and talk tech from the perspective of what it's like to own and use these devices. If at the end of this video, you like what you watched, don't forget to smash that subscribe button, click the thumbs up, and the notification bell. It shows your appreciation for the incredible amount of time that goes into making these. Let's rock. The model I have here comes with 16 gig of RAM and 512 gig of storage, which I purchased for 776 US dollars before taxes. By the way, I purchased this with my own money and I'm not sponsored by Lenovo. Let's start with CPU performance. The new Ryzen 4 700U 8 core 8 thread processor is a monster in Geekbench. Although it doesn't quite hit the multi-core score of the 8 core 16 thread MacBook Pro 16, and yes, I am comparing it to a $2,500 laptop, it wallops Intel's Core i7 4 core 8 thread Ice Lake processor in much more expensive laptops like the Dell XPS 9300 and the MacBook Pro 13. In single core performance, it is neck and neck with the best laptops out there. By the way, this laptop does offer two performance modes, the default intelligent cooling and extreme performance. Moving on to Cinebench R20, which maxes out the CPU cores, is where this CPU combined with the cooling in this chassis really shines. It makes a complete mockery of Intel laptops that cost more than twice its price. The only laptop that beat it was the 8-core version of the MacBook Pro 16, which is over three times the price. When we look at CPU speeds while under load, you can see that it starts at a lofty 4.2 GHz on extreme performance mode, which is odd as this processor is only meant to go up to 4.1 GHz single core. It then stabilizes at 3.6 GHz, higher than any other laptop in this list. When looking at power draw, I saw around 33 watts of power being fed to the CPU, which is around the same as the MacBook Pro 13 drew, even though its Cinebench performance was only two thirds of the idea pads. By the way, I got some odd results here with extreme performance mode. Hardware info stated that the CPU only drew around 26 watts of power. I would have expected it to draw more than on intelligent cooling. CPU temperatures were very good, maxing out at 86 Celsius, nowhere near the 100 Celsius I see on the Dell XPS 9300, the MacBook Pro 13, or the MacBook Air. On chassis temperatures, the ones you would actually feel if you used the laptop, they were very good. On intelligent cooling, the laptop remained comfortably cool to the touch. On extreme performance, it did get a bit warmer, but thankfully nothing like the hot temperatures on the XPS 9300's chassis. The IDPad 515 was noticeably cooler on extreme performance, but it has a bigger chassis, which tends to allow more airflow, and the material used on the chassis doesn't seem to conduct as much heat as on the IDPad 514. The fan does seem to turn off when on battery power, but when plugged in, it seems to be always on. That being said, it's only slightly noticeable in a quiet room. I really don't think it's loud enough to be disturbing if you plan to use this laptop in a classroom or a library. Under load, it sounded similar to the Dell XPS 13 when on intelligent cooling, which is good. On extreme performance, it sounded as loud as the MacBook Pro 13. Overall, given that the fans aren't high pitched, the volume from the fans is good. By the way, I noticed no coil whine in my unit. All right, onto real world applications, and this laptop had mixed results. It performed very well opening up Microsoft Office documents and some coding tasks like starting the integrated development environment IntelliJ, compiling code, and debugging on the Jagboss application server. In the MySQL large database reload though, it didn't perform as well and was similar to the XPS but slower than the MacBook Pro and Air. One hypothesis is that the SSD speed of this laptop may have something to do with it. Lucky it's user replaceable. For other tasks, it didn't perform as well. I found it interesting that the IdeaPad 515 started much quicker even though it had the same fast start setting. Where this laptop did not perform well at all, in fact it was a disaster, was in Premiere Pro when exporting standard H.264 footage used on, say, YouTube. When looking at Task Manager, I could see straight away that the GPU was not being used. It was doing a software render even though I told Premiere to do a hardware one. The IdeaPad 515 with the Ryzen 4 500 new CPU fared even worse. Not only does it have a 6-core processor versus the 8-core in the IdeaPad 14, but my unit came with 8GB of RAM compared to the 16 that I got in my IdeaPad 14. 
You can see when we look at the memory area in Task Manager that while rendering, the IdeaPad 514 is making use of that extra RAM. So my theory is that the IdeaPad 515 is also being bottlenecked due to only 8GB of RAM. It seems Premiere Pro does not take advantage of AMD's video coding engine at all. Hopefully Adobe can release an update to enable this. I did try a couple of rounds of League of Legends and found it played very well at 1080 settings. My Fire Strike scores confirm this. You can see it beat out Intel's new G7 graphics in the far more expensive Dell XPS. So I'd classify this laptop as good enough for casual gaming, but nothing more. Memory is set up in dual channel for optimal performance, just like on the 15 inch model, which is great. By the way, if you are comparing this laptop to other budget laptops, please factor this in. Take a look at the new Dell Inspiron 5000 series with AMD. Many have single channel RAM, which will perform substantially worse. The Samsung NVMe SSD isn't the fastest out there, but it is pretty fast. It's marginally faster than the Sky Hynix in the 15, and it's about as fast as the one in the Dell XPS 9300. Wi-Fi speeds are great, no drops, and it's the new Intel AX200 Wi-Fi 6 chip. Yay, nice to see Lenovo can put this into their budget range, even though Apple can't manage to put it into their pro range. The display is of a similar quality to the IdeaPad 515, which is very good for a laptop under $800, but definitely worse than more expensive laptops. The brightness is good enough, and combined with the fact that both of these laptops have matte panels, which aren't reflective, means it should be very viewable in a moderately bright room, and a little sunlight. By the way, I know in my original video of the IdeaPad 515, I scored higher brightness. For some reason, after numerous retests, I could not reproduce that score. So these are my most recent readings. The colors aren't very accurate. That being said, it's definitely better than the display in the Asus Swift 3 that Dave 2D reviewed. Unless you are only using the laptop with an external monitor, I would avoid the Asus Swift 3 for this reason. As this is a 14 inch 1080 panel, you are faced with what I consider a bad choice in Windows display scaling settings. Either run it at 125%, which makes everything look too big, or at 100%, which makes everything look too small. Although this is completely subjective, I find 125% works better on a 13 inch and 100% works better on a 15. In Windows, you can set a custom scaling like so. I personally set this laptop to 110%. This screen is not a touchscreen, unlike the IdeaPad 515. I also did not detect any PWM flickering when lowering the brightness, which is good. There was a mild amount of backlight bleeding in my unit, but there were no dead pixels. Overall, this screen should be sufficient for using office applications and coding. I would avoid using it for photo or video editing though, unless you just can't spend more than 800 US dollars. This is because it's probably the best screen you'll get in that price range, unless of course you buy secondhand. The key the keyboard is excellent, just like on the IdeaPad 515, very satisfying key travel and click. Big spacious layout and no odd surprises where keys are placed. No number pad though, but keys are backlit which is good too. The trackpad is also very good and works very well. The speakers sound decent and there is nice stereo separation. The speakers also face upwards so they won't be muted if you use this laptop on your lap. But there is certainly no bass and it doesn't come close to the MacBook Pro 13 speakers. In fact, I found the IdeaPad 515 speakers to be louder. Audio latency is really good, and while Latency Mon was running, I did do some rather heavy tasks on the laptop. The chassis looks and feels more premium than on the IdeaPad 515. Because of the material used in darker color, it does pick up fingerprints. However, it's not a fingerprint magnet like the black Razer laptops. By the way, I noticed no sharp edges and the laptop can be opened with one hand. The port situation is okay. The good news is that the laptop is charged by the single USB-C port. Plus, there are two USB-A ports and an SD card reader. So for most folks, you're covered. The bad news is that the SD card reader isn't the fastest and neither are the USB ports, which are all 3.1 Gen 1. What's extremely important that you should know if you plan to use an external monitor is that in the 15 inch version, the HDMI connector is only 1.4B. That means you will only get 30 frames per second when driving a 4K screen, which is a terrible experience as just moving the mouse feels jolty. On the 14 inch though, I discovered that even though it is also noted as 1.4B on Lenovo's product page, I actually got 60 frames per second at 4K, meaning it is likely HDMI 2.0. But before you say, I can't get the 15 inch laptop because of this, if you plug the monitor in via the USB-C port, then it will use the DisplayPort signal and can drive a 4K monitor at 60 frames per second. 
So you're probably thinking you should get the 14 inch version as it gives you more flexibility when using an external monitor, right? Not so fast. The 14 inch version has a different downside due to its ports. It doesn't have the barrel pin charger and only charges over the single USB-C port. If you want to use any other USB-C devices that don't deliver power to the laptop, you have to run the laptop on battery power while doing so. A minor annoyance, because the charging port is only on the left side of the laptop, you will have to run a cable around the back if you plan to use an outlet on the right side. The laptop weighed in at 1.4 kilograms or 3.1 pounds versus 1.6 kilograms or 3.6 pounds in the IdeaPad 515. Both of these I'd consider light and portable for their size. Battery life was around five hours in my test with brightness set to max doing tasks like writing the script and watching Netflix. Similar to the IdeaPad 515, they both have a 57 watt hour battery and on battery life, I noticed no slowdowns of performance, which was good. Like the IdeaPad 515, the webcam is pretty bad, but at least it's placed in a good place and it has a privacy filter. The fingerprint reader also worked well. The charger is a 65 watt USB-C one, but as mentioned, because there is only one USB-C port, if you want to plug something else into that port, you will have to run the laptop on battery power, which is very annoying. They should have added a second. Opening up the laptop, I could see one large fan and a replaceable SSD. It is the smaller length M.2 type though. To my delight, I found a second full length M.2 slot available. I experienced zero blue screens or lockups while using this laptop, which is good. All right, here's what I think. Just like the IdeaPad 515, this is a revolutionary device for the budget category. Six months ago, I could not have imagined getting a powerful eight core CPU, 16 gig of RAM, a 512 gig SSD, and a decent screen for under 800 US dollars. I would have thought you found some great secondhand deal or something. Putting the internal components aside though, as there will be models of the 15 inch with this CPU and RAM, if this were your only laptop, I would recommend getting the 15 inch over the 14. Two reasons for this. One, the 15 inch has two options for charging, which means you can charge it while also using the USB-C port. And two, for displays like these, which aren't the brightest or the most color accurate, I find the larger 15 inch to be more comfortable on the eyes than the 14. Plus the 15 inch is already very lightweight and portable anyway. If you think you aren't going to ever use the USB-C port or are getting this to supplement a bigger laptop or desktop at home, then sure, get the 14 inch. That being said, for everyday users who are just browsing the web and watching Netflix, if you can come up with the extra 150 US dollars, I'd advise you to get the base model MacBook Air instead. Even though it is far less powerful, it is powerful enough for you, and it has a much better screen and has two USB-C ports. If you do want the power though, this 14 inch laptop paired with a good external monitor that charges via USB-C like the one I mentioned is going to be an awesome combo and I highly recommend it. Finally, it's going to take a bit of time for major software developers like Adobe to update their applications to take full advantage of these new AMD processors. But the more of us who buy these, the more pressure it will place on them to hurry up. Tons of people have messaged me saying that these models aren't available. I have reached out to Lenovo and they are being sold, but are just frequently out of stock due to supply issues and probably popularity. So if you see one and want one, don't dilly dally. Well, that's all for today, folks. If you like this video, you know what to do. Smash that subscribe button, click the thumbs up and the notification bell. Until next time, I'll see you later.